folks are all right with that. Cool. Yeah, hello. Thank you for being here. Uh, coming to our thank you for coming to our panel discussion at the 2021 Strawberry and Justice Festival. Uh, my name is Eileen. My pronouns are they, them, and I will be the moderator today for our panel. And I'm one of the garden coordinators at PICA, uh, the program in community and agroecology. And I'm so excited to be here today. We have incredible speakers talking about some dope things that they're doing, great work that they're doing with farm workers. Um, and yeah, we can go ahead and get started for, with our slideshow. Yeah, if we could go to the next slide. Cool, thank you. Yes, yeah, so as a preface, we are FizzWig. Um, shout out to all the incredible organizers who are putting this event together today. We have multiple events happening. Um, FizzWig stands for the Food System Working Groups. And yeah, feel free to check out our Instagram and stay updated with us with all of our events we have going on. Yeah, and then we're also gonna get started with a land acknowledgement, um, just to like acknowledge that UC Santa Cruz is located on the unceded territory of the uh, Ayahuaswas, a speaking Yupi tribe, the Amamutsan tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to the mission of Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast. And they're working hard today to restore the traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. But obviously this land acknowledgement does not do enough justice. And we also wanted to provide some more resources as well. Um, yeah, if we could go to the next slide. Thank you. Yeah, so we have some Amamutsan tribal band resources. These are ways like to get involved. Um, they have different campaigns going on, such as protecting Juristec, which is um, land that they're trying to gain access to again. But if you would like to begin, become involved with their work and informed, like, yeah, feel free to check out these, their like Instagram page and their websites. Um, you guys will have access to these slides. So yeah, feel free to go through these links as well and like donation links as well. But yeah, like I said, uh, the Strawberry and Justice Festival has events going on all day today. So like, be sure to check that out. Today's our panel. We also have another music event. And yeah, if we go to the next slide. Cool, yeah, there's also a jam workshop and a cooking workshop. So if you have time, yeah, feel free to check those out. I think they're also gonna be all recorded. So yes, but we can get started with our panelists introductions. Um, and yeah, for our panel this year, we are honored to welcome back James Nakahara, along with our new speaker, Irene Juarez O'Connell, um, to talk about their work and their advocacy and direct aid for local farm workers. And yeah, we'll get started with Irene and providing an overview of their work. And yeah, so please feel free to hold on to all of your questions until the end, and we'll make space for you guys to get those questions answered. But yeah, let's show some love and some, some care for Irene and their project involved with the Campesina X Womb Care Project resources. If you go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, but yeah, this project, uh, Campesina X Womb Care Project, it's led by, uh, you know, they put together so many uh, womb care bags for farm workers and they also help with like rent, funeral expenses and other donations for farm workers um, throughout like Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. And this is led by like Maria San Ramos Barcomontes and Irene. And yeah, I can pass it over to Irene to talk more about this work and her slideshow. Thank you so much. It's so great to be um, on this panel. I've long heard about the Strawberry Justice Festival, never been able to be there in person. So I'm happy to be here virtually. Um, yes, I'm Irene or Irene Juarez O'Connell, and I am one half of the founders of uh, Campesina Next Womb Care. And we provide womb care kits for indigenous farm worker women in Watsonville, California. Next slide, please. So we got started um, in, just a year ago, actually, and what we know about the, the labor conditions in Watsonville has only been exasperated since COVID-19. Um, it's always been bad. And I think that um, the pandemic really highlighted just the, the level of um, lack of support for farm workers. Most farm workers who are here in Watsonville in the Central Valley are um, indigenous coming from Southern Mexico. And most of them are recently arrived. 
They struggle to meet basic needs. They're living in deplorable housing conditions and they're working in unsafe and harsh environments. Um, in addition, they don't have uh, health care and most don't qualify for any social services due to their immigration status. They cannot afford to miss work even when they're sick. Um, and so, you know, as this term essential workers really emerged throughout this coronavirus um, pandemic, we, we realize that these most essential workers, the ones who put food on our tables for us to eat every day, are struggling to even get fed themselves and are forced to work in um, with very little protection. Farm worker life expectancy is only 48, 49 years old average. Um, so how, you know, if we're thinking about this in the context of reproductive justice, if, you know, a woman is, uh, has that life expectancy, we know that there is definitely um, impacts on her reproductive health. Uh, so this project really got started. It was a, a vision from Maria Bracomontes, um, Maria Ramos Bracomontes, who's a midwife, nurse midwife at Salud para la Gente in Watsonville. So she was seeing indigenous farm workers every day. And something to note is that a lot of them don't have proficiency in Spanish. They speak their indigenous language because they're they're coming directly from Southern Mexico. And um, they are coming in for prenatal care, but they have a lot of untreated health conditions. If you could go to the next slide, please. Their pregnancies become high risk. And oftentimes because of the racism in the medical field, they don't feel safe disclosing the needs that they have, um, whether it's mental health or domestic violence support, or just fear of the involvement or um, from the state and being separated for their children. We find that womb justice work for indigenous farm workers is generational work. Um, if we consider all of the impacts that, that um, affect farm worker reproductive health, the, the number one thing is poverty, right? All of the things that I mentioned earlier, the conditions that a lot of the, the women and, and womb carriers are, are facing in the fields. A lot of them um, aren't able to take bathroom breaks, so that impacts their um, urinary tract. So, so they were coming into the clinic with a lot of complaints about UTIs. Um, like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of racism in the medical field, so they're, they're having conditions untreated. Um, there's also a history of forced sterilization that impacts the womb and um, sexual assault in the fields. A lot of that is unfortunately happening and going unreported. So these are all the things that uh, impact reproductive health and there's not really a lot of access to services. Um, so in April of last year, we realized, oh, I'm sorry, it was March, uh, Maria and I, we both got our stimulus checks and we said we have to we have to get this to the farm workers um and so if you could go to the next slide the net the first thing that we did was we put a call out on instagram and we just said hey who has uh can bring boxes of menstrual pads and masks and bandanas and and things that and soap and things that we can um offer to the campesinas because they were coming into the clinic asking maria if she could if they if she could give them menstrual pads that was actually a luxury that they couldn't afford and it seems like it would be um, a basic need right a basic right for people to bleeding menstruating folks to be able to receive um hygiene you know uh products so our very first um our very first if you can go to the next slide our very first distribution was actually on mother's day may 8th of 2020 and we put together 20 I'm sorry, 91 bags, and each bag was hand stamped with an affirming message, Viva la Mujer. We also put affirming messages inside the pads that said, um, Su matriz es sagrada, your womb is sacred. Just trying to really affirm that, that they are not forgotten about, that they matter, that their bodies matter, that their lives matter. Um, if you could go to the next slide. So from there we started, um, doing it monthly. So by July, we were adding $20 bills. We also made sure to always include the essentials, which were the menstrual pads, soap. We were uh, doing uh, Dr. Bronner soap, 
masks, bandanas, and some kind of herbal teas. So uh, things that the campesinos might be familiar with uh, in Mexico, like manzanilla, which is chamomile, um, uh, jamaica, hibiscus, and those are the, also things that support womb health. Uh, we also included salves, so pain relief salves that we would make with, um, we would make ourselves to support muscle tension, um, vitamins, we would include um, tinctures, uh, all things that we would make ourselves or have people donate to us. Next slide, please. So the medicine making aspect is a very important aspect of this work. Um, it's, it's our response to an industrialized medical system that kind of that doesn't take a holistic approach or doesn't understand the cultural background of the patient or understand the, the, the full picture. So a lot of the approach that we take has to do with accessing, tapping into the ancestral and indigenous wisdom that we're familiar with, that, that the campesinos themselves are familiar with. Um, we also, being a collective of um, mostly femmes, women, non-binary folks, we, we thought it was important to work with moon cycles. We're working with, um, you know, making medicines around the new moon, and, and then we're doing our distributions around the full moon. The next slide, please. And so we've grown since then. Every month um, we were putting out, um, so in August we had 100 bags. By September we had 200 bags. And we were getting folks coming, um, dropping off backpacks for the school, um, beginning of the school year. We also started getting specific. Uh, so the pink bags were specific for pregnancy care because we were seeing, um, oh, I guess I should mention, um, the way that we were getting these bags to the farm workers was through partnership with the Center for Farm Worker Families, led by Dr. Ann Lopez. And every second Friday of the month, they do um, a distribution, which is called the Oaxacan Community Shed, um, where we're, they're getting donations from Second Harvest Food Bank, um, other efforts around the county. And so we were showing up to those every month, um, offering the bags. So, so the pink bags were pregnancy care, we started offering specific postpartum care, um, teen uh, care bags, things for babies, like baby clothes and baby carriers. So we started expanding as people started um, becoming aware of our project and felt really called to, to donate and give what they had. Next slide, please. By December, we um, we realized that the winter time is a really difficult time financially for a lo lot of farm workers. A lot of the harvest season is over. Um, many are struggling to make rent and meet basic needs. So rather than do bags, we put together some medicines, we had vitamins, and we passed out envelopes with uh, notes of appreciation and $20 bills. So in December, we gave out about $5,580 and 279 families all received an envelope um, with a little cash and a little love note. Next slide, please. Um, we kept getting uh, requests for rental assistance. I think that was um, more and more we would see women coming back to the uh, distributions, asking for specific things that were in the in the womb care bags and really appreciating the womb care bags. Um, but overwhelmingly, we would we would get asked for support with the rent. And so in March, we held a raffle just through our Instagram and we were able to raise $3,000, which provided four Campesina families with rental assistance. So that was cash that went directly into the hands of families who needed it. Next slide. So here we are um, in March, a full, well, in March and April, we were making a full year cycle and um, we're getting more sophisticated with the, with the distribution, um, I'm sorry, the bag assembly. So you can see that uh, we're here at the Museum of Art and History, which has been a really amazing partner and has allowed us to use their space since they had been closed um, for the past year to, to set up our assembly. So. Um, yeah, in March, we were able to set up 200 bags and each with $20 bills, pads, all of the essential things, plus um, a lot of extra goodies. Next slide. 
So in total, um, in the past year, we've offered 1,500 womb care kits. We've distributed $26,000 in cash. And most of this has come from grassroots funding. Um, we aren't a nonprofit. We're working kind of as a grassroots mutual aid project. It's just me and Maria doing this on our, our free time, I guess, um, but with the support of a lot of uh, folks who really understand why this is so necessary. Um, here you can see Maria uh, offering, this was uh, for our Mother's Day and one year celebration. We gave everybody roses, tea, we gave everyone tamales. But yeah, uh, I think in total, our math, um, based on goods, so we were, we were assessing that each womb care bag uh, was about a 50 to $70 value. So at the minimum, we've distributed about $54,000 in, in just the physical goods. Next slide. So although that uh, we've been able to distribute uh, and, and offer a lot of amazing medicine and support, the need is still really high, especially in these past winter months, there have been lines around the block. And unfortunately, even though we'll show up with about 200 bags, there's still families who um, don't receive a bag. And so we try our best to have like extra bags of tea and vitamins and soaps and things like that. But the need is just really, really high. Uh, there's about 400 families who come to the distribution every month. And there are new arrivals of indigenous um, people coming to this county every day and there's no support for them. There's no state social services or, or any kind of support for them. So many of them are going hungry. Many of them are, are just in deep suffering and, and um, as much as possible, you know, we, we are trying to hustle and continue to raise funds and continue to do what we can to offer um, support for the campesinas, but again, we're just two people and we would love some more support. So if you could go to the next slide, we have ways that you can um, join us or, or contribute. If you feel called, our Venmo is Corazón de Matriz, which uh, translates to heart of the womb. Our PayPal is campesinexwombcare at gmail.com. And actually this Sunday, we're gonna be doing another assembly at the Museum of Art and History. We really, really, really could use boxes of pads. Those are the hardest things for us to find and often the most expensive. So if everyone even just brought one box of pads and we had like, I don't know, 50 folks show, show up, that would be, that would serve a lot of um, people. Um, and of course you're invited to follow us on Instagram at Compassinix Womb Care. Um, the, the logo, the Viva La Mujer, was something that I designed, and we're going to be putting out some merch as a fundraiser soon, some tote bags and some shirts. Um, every single dollar sent helps, um, considering the, the dire situation of farm workers in our county. And it really is impactful being at these distributions, seeing, um, you know, oftentimes they, they switch every month at a different location because they have to be clandestine, they have to be secret um, because of the immigration status of these workers. So it's really uh, impactful and, and devastating to see that the people who work the hardest to make sure that we're fed have to hide in order to get fed, to get their food and basic needs met. So this is, this is certainly a way, um, a labor of love and we would love support. Um, let's see, there's a question. Yeah, there's, um, I think just connect with us on Instagram and DM us if you have other donations outside of May 23rd. I think we're gonna actually gonna be taking a little break after this next distribution to kind of reassess and see how to make this work sustainable. We could certainly use long-term support, um, like people who um, are good at finding grants and um, communications and, and are really committed to reproductive justice for indigenous people in our county. Uh, we especially want to work with birth workers. We want to work with birth workers of color. We want to work with folks who understand that this is generational work. This is um, work that's that impacts uh, lineages both forward and backward, I think. So um, yeah, we have the privilege of living in this really beautiful county and having this abundance of food around us. And I think it, for me, feels really fulfilling to um, give back to the people who make it possible. 
Yes, thank you, thank so, you much so much for Sherry. listening. And I'm up. Yes, thank you so much. Gosh, you're doing such incredible work that, like, you know, the people, most essential workers are in need of. And, like, thank God, yeah, for people like yourselves and others are actually organizing to distribute these resources. Um, yeah, we have a couple of questions for you before we open it up for uh, questions and answers from everybody else. And I also just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, like your background as well. I should have done so prior, but yeah, just as a reminder for like the new folks that are here too, um, Irene is doing incredible work with creating like womb care product kits um, for farm workers. And Irene is a mentor, educator, and advocate for the youth and young people in Santa Cruz, um, originally from Los Angeles. Irene has come to Santa Cruz to study public art and Latin American and Latino studies at UCSC. And having previously served the community in a mentorship roles in, in local high schools uh, in the, and the Santa Cruz Juvenile Detention Center, Irene has joined Food What in 2016. So she's also part of uh, CASFIS. And with the experience in community organizing around youth violence prevention, um, she's passionate about the intersections of where the youth expression and creativity can meet empowerment for lasting impactful change for their lives and their communities. So yeah, very excited um, work that Irene is doing, especially with like young leaders too, and have her hands in the soil. And yeah, Irene has also received the next tie for the Artist of the Year 2017 Award and the Eduardo Carrillo Healing in the Community with Art Award in the same year. So lots of experience from your background. And I'm curious as well as to like, you know, organizing all these different, like not only like womb care kits, but I mean, also like things like for the youth, other things like for other different types of farm workers. Um, how does like maybe this work intersect with like the work that you're doing with Food What? Yeah, I, I actually ask myself this question because sometimes I'm like, okay, I'm I'm in my food what role, and now I'm in the the womb care work role. But it's all intersected, right? Like the the youth that we work with are youth, are children of farm workers. They are working in the fields themselves. They they want to know about this um, this type of offerings. They want to know about what mutual aid is. They want to know about uh, ancestral medicines and, and remedios and things that are traditional healing modalities in their own families, but maybe have been stigmatized due to their assimilation process in the U.S. So um, a majority of the youth that we work with are based in Watsonville, even though um, we have our site at the Castus Farm. We haven't been there in the last year because of the pandemic. We will be returning uh, once a week this summer, but for the most part, we are working with, with Watsonville youth and, and through that them, Watsonville families. And we feel, we see, we witness the impacts of these uh, structural injustices, the poverty, the racism that impacts um, the farm worker community. This is our community. This is who we work with. Um, this is, we want the youth also to see um, for those who aren't working in the fields to, for them to see that they their their lives are inextricably connected um we've actually had a couple young people join us at the distribution um uh, there was a young man who's been through the criminal justice system who showed up to the the distribution to to offer support and i think that's really amazing to be able to build um leadership and and um, intersecting support for one another to see, you know, that our community, it might feel, it might feel because we don't see what's going on in the fields or we don't see the realities of where people are living that sometimes it's, um, that information is not made available. Oftentimes, it, you know, this, this population working in the fields, they're invisibilized. And I think um, the more that we can bring more visibility and exposure to the ways that um, that we can actually help one another. I think all of us, but the youth especially, will feel empowered to see themselves as agents of change in their own communities. Yeah, that's really beautiful. I mean, honestly, because I mean, with like farm workers working like, you know, such long hours and living these invisible lives, because like some folks are undocumented, you know, a lot of like young people have been losing like that generational um, like history of like culture and like, you know, what that means for them and like their own resources that they have. So it's incredible that you guys are just like, yeah, not even only addressing like womb care kids, but also like, you know, addressing the cultural 
loss that there has been, you know, with like different ways that people have like addressed uh, issues or like, you know, like remedies and things of that sort. So that's incredible. I love to hear that. The youth are hungry for it. The youth are hungry for it. Like, so we did a workshop at Food Wet where we had, um, we talked about what are remedios, what are traditional healing uh, things in your family. And just for them to be like, oh, there is a reason why my grandmother always makes manzanilla tea or or puts herbs on my back if I have a cold or like, oh, I thought that was just kind of a weird thing that my family did, but then they hear from each other and then they get affirmations from, from Food Wet staff that like, that is something that's really powerful to hold on to. Um, so I've been able to, you know, really benefit a lot from just hearing stories and then also learning, you know, back to the, to the womb care uh, project is hearing directly from the campesinas what they like what they're interested in has been really um impactful for us to to begin to like you know focus and, and really um you know um just kind of affirm that the that the indigenous technology that exists right working with the plants working with um the moon cycles like th those are real and you know th that's something we need to not let um imperialist capitalism destroy or erase yes very much so energy is constantly flowing and they cannot deny us of like what our ancestors have always known we also want to open up to to the audience if anybody has some questions um i'm not sure if you had addressed the question from ali ali if you want to speak on that question or oh. we can also read it off Yeah, I see. Uh, do you all have a doula program, a birth doula? Allie's a birth doula and love to offer volunteer services. Yes, Allie, please get in touch because I think that is the next level of this work. Um, this project was, was about meeting immediate needs and trying to distribute goods and, and things that, um, that people need. And I, want, I think we want to continue doing that, but also building a next layer where we are building a team of birth workers who can be responsive, um, maybe going out to people's homes, offering prenatal care or postpartum visits um, in a culturally sensitive way and in a way that is gonna make the, the campesinas feel seen and supported and heard. Um, so, so yeah, please get in touch because I think that is the next layer of this vision is to actually build clinics designed specifically for farm workers um that maybe are that exists kind of outside of the um racist medical complex that we have operating right now yeah i definitely something also to... we're thank you <laughs> something also that is is to keep in mind is for like chest feeding nursing campesinas how do they nurse their babies how what if they're working you know 10 hours a day there's no um, nursing stations in the fields, you know, so so that is something that um, we have to continue pushing for and advocating for. Oh, and if you're uh, trying to um, do Venmo, there is an option to skip the four digit code, just put skip or there should be an option to skip that. Thank you for donating. <laughs> Yes, that's incredible. There's lots of opportunities to get involved with this. And yeah, also check out their page as well. Um, yeah, it seems they have a lot of meeting times for folks to get involved. But yeah, if there's any other questions, or I can ask my last question as well. Alrighty, y'all, no yeah. worries. I guess my last question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess my last question for you is just, yeah, like, how have you seen, like, the impact on these kids uh, for the for these farm workers. I mean, like, yeah, I know you've been saying that like more people are just becoming more aware about it and like gathering these kids and like yeah, picking them up. And you've talked about even like it evolving into like having like visiting homes like for um like for pregnancies or for postpartum. But I can't imagine, yeah, like the impact that it's making on the community, like on a positive aspect, especially with like so many positive affirmations you guys are giving. Um, but yeah, like what are just your experiences that you've seen or heard or feedback? You know, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit hard to tell because every month it's not the same group of 
um, families that are coming through. Like I said, there's so many recent arrivals um, that every once in a while we, we will see the same person and they'll give us feedback. They'll say, oh, we really liked that pomada, that salve. Do you have more that helped me? Um, or we'll see them around town wearing the bags or uh, a couple of them have my phone number and they'll text me every month to ask for what they need. So a little bit of relationship building has been really amazing. Actually, one of the campesinas, I'm also a muralist and I have a mural at the Museum of Art and History right now. It's free, you can go check it out. Uh, one of the campesinas that I made friends with is actually portrayed in the mural. It's uh, the murals in the secret garden behind like Abbott Square. And there's actually a QR code. If you go to that mural, you can put your phone up to the QR code and it takes you to a SoundCloud recording of her voice to actually all six figures in the mural speaking on what healing means to them, including her speaking on what healing is to her. So there have been really amazing ripple effects from, from this project. Um, but the truth is like, it's so hard to, to be in touch with all of the women who receive the wound kits again, because we see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of women coming through, of families coming through each month. Um, so we're not really able to collect a lot of data, but we do feel the, uh, I think we, we feel that there is like that moment of exchange of them just feeling really cared for and really supported. Um, but again, there's, there's still more to do. <laughs> so yeah. Well, that's incredible. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm speaking for myself and I'm sure for other people too. We're so excited to see this like continue to upscale and just like make such a positive impact. And yeah, also check out the the um, the museum there and find that QR code because I'm really interested in that to hear that those voices. Yeah, check out that mural. It's up until July or no, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's up until next July. So um, it's going to be up for the rest of the year. And um, yeah, it's just a way again to to bring like, how do we bring in the voices of people who don't often get platform for them to speak on what healing means to them and what they need for their healing and liberation? Wow, that's so that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. We also want to make time for our other speaker as well. Um, but yes, thank you so much. Yeah, please, everybody show some love. And yeah, get ready for the for our next speaker as well. And see how these like works can also interact or intersect with each other. Um, but I want to introduce, yes, thank you, Yari. Um, I want to introduce James Nakahara. Um, he was born and raised in Oakland, California. He spent the last 10 years working in various fields of agriculture, including, but not limited to, uh, orchard management, small and medium-sized diversified organic productions, holistic animal operations. Um, he served on the Ecological Farm Association Board of Directors and Planning Committee, making big decisions, as well as the Diversity Adversary, Diversity Adversary Group. Ooh. And James is currently working supporting farmers and ranchers along the coast as farm business advisor for kitchen table advisors. And they seek to support, you know, sustainability of small farmers and ranchers through like one-on-one -on -one coaching and business management support. And not only that, but he's also an apprentice at the UCSC Farm and Garden Program from 2013. So please, yeah, show lots of love for James. We're so happy and appreciative for you to be here to speak with us. Um, but yeah, I believe you have a slideshow. You can go ahead. Yeah, um, maybe before, because once I once I share the screen, I'm gonna disappear or I won't be able to see everybody. So um, before I do that, I just want to say. Um, Irene, that was so great to get that update in here about all the work that you all are doing and it's really inspirational. And uh, I'm trying to think about ways that maybe we can figure out how to help support because um, it's, it's you're, you're addressing a very imminent and pressing need in the community uh, and solving it in a very meaningful way. Um, so thank you so much for all of that work. Um, yeah, I think, so I'm, I'm really curious what, people would like to talk would like for me to talk about because um i could talk about like i'm a japanese american and my family were farmers in salinas valley before world war ii when they were forcibly forcibly incarcerated for you know the duration of the war and i'd be happy to talk about that experience i'd also be happy to just talk about some of the challenges that um farmers are facing today is is like from what I'm hearing, um, both with the clients that I have on the coast and in other regions, our 
our organization serves 16 counties in the Bay Area. And um, I think this year we have about 81 clients. And um, one thing I'll add about our organization is we, um, we are specifically oriented to help um, communities that represent marginalized demographics, women, people of color, LGBTQ. Um, those are the folks that we want to help support because um, due to many, many things, but um, you know, capitalism, systemic oppression, there are a lot of extra barriers for access for those folks. And um, so it's, it's our purview to, to provide support there. Uh, there are other farms that might need advising and support, but we, you know, if, if other businesses can afford it, we wouldn't work with them. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm curious, what, what do folks want to go into? Um, feel free to pop it in the chat. I have a um, kind of a, a slideshow that I put together about my family's experience that I could that I could go into. Um, and there's some interesting parallels uh, with what's happening today. But um, and, and maybe I'll just roll with that if nobody has anything else. But please, while I'm doing that, like ask questions. Um, if I don't see it in the chat, maybe um, maybe somebody can just like be like, hey, there's a question because um, I won't be able to see. But um, let me pull up my slideshow. Yeah, if, if nobody has like any pressing um, preferences for what they want to hear from James, because James, yeah, you have a very uh, dense background that we would love to hear about. And I guess like specific, like maybe if you want to like focus on your work, like maybe like how like your like experience from like your family's um, like experience as well from their identity and how that's like translated into your work. And even like, you know, maybe touching on like possibilities for intersections with uh, Irene's work. Yeah, uh, there's some interesting parallels, um, actually. And yeah, so maybe I can just, let me, let's see. Okay, screen share this. Okay. And there's like a present button somewhere. There we go. Okay, can everybody see this? Great, and then if I do that, that works. Okay, great. Um, some of these I'm not going to uh, stay on for too long um, because it's it's kind of a long slideshow. But um, OK, and, and threads to today. Um, I'll just start with kind of some broad strokes. But uh, in the immediate aftermath of Pearl Harbor, uh, the US government decided to forcibly incarcerate 120,000 Japanese Americans. They were mostly citizens, had done nothing um, overtly criminal or illegal or seditious or anything like that. Um, the, the agricultural conditions in California at the time were um, the primary farm working uh, demographic was Japanese Americans. Um, and they actually coming from Japan, uh, farming was kind of an honored tradition. So um, let me, here we go. So um, they were, a lot of immigrants were really excited to be able to work land and have agency to have parcels of land. And in these two photos here, we have um, some sugar beet farmers on the left and uh, the two women on the right are actually farming in, um, in one of the uh, prison camps. Um, there was a lot of, there was a lot of like in internment camps, the, the people who were there kind of had to make their own little gardens because the food that was being provided is uh, of very poor quality. And I'm gonna circle back to that, um, talking about my own family who's pictured here. Um, the beautiful woman in the middle is my bachan, my grandma. And um, this was a photo taken when they were at Amachi, Colorado. Like I said, they all uh, started out in Salinas. Um, my grandmother and grandfather actually got married two weeks after the order came out because if they hadn't have been married, they would have been split up and sent to different camps and they wanted the families to stay together. So that's why they got married. Um, shortly after arriving over there, uh, Bachan actually became pregnant. Um, and let's see, that's just like some 
wedding lights and stuff. These are photos of uh, the assembly centers in Salinas. Um, it's kind of like what it was like when they, you know, people didn't have a lot of time to pack. It was very much like grab what you can and go. We're not sure if we're coming back. Um, and there's a photo here. This is this is kind of the, what the living conditions were like. Um, and folks had to shovel their own coal and things like that. One one story that our family holds very dearly is that, uh, and and this this actually ties in pretty directly to the work that Irene's doing. Um, my grandfather, Bach or Jichan, was working uh, for another farmer as part of a work furlough program during uh, their time in camp, and. It was during this time that Bachan was pregnant and the food was really bad. The living conditions were bad. There was no insulation for any of these rooms. There were barns and uh, stables and things like that. And the farmer who Jichan was working for uh, was a white farmer named Vernon Strode and his wife, um, who Juanita, who is a Mexican woman, um, found out Jichan told Vernon that his wife, my grandmother, was sick, not healthy. Um, there were a lot of um, issues with childbirth during their time in camp uh, for a lot of people. And Juanita was um, heard the story and was like, you're going to sneak food in. You're going to break the rules to make sure that she has food. Um, and so they, Juanita and Vernon, were able to sneak in more vegetables, more produce um, that they were growing in their garden to help support my grandmother's health while she was pregnant with my uncle, um, who was born healthy thanks to the quality of the, you know, the food and and the and the care um, that they were able to get from from having some allies outside of the. Um, you know, internment. Um, of course, this is like, you know, was was Jichan getting fairly compensated for the work that he was doing for Vernon Strode, the farmer? Probably not. You know, like there's a lot of injustice woven throughout all of this, but like it's important to identify times where people really stepped up and did the right thing. And um, this is a good example of that. Uh, and that's so that's Bachan with um with my uncle marty um you know shortly after he was born <laughs> um let's see uh oh um oh well, this is just they weren't really allowed to have their own spaces of their own things in the camp they had to grow for people outside of the camp or outside of the walls and so they kept a little citrus garden which or a succulent garden which um, and because of all the wartime stuff, they weren't allowed to have any writing utensils. So, um, Jichan did watercolors. He was an architect and he did these on the drywall of the barracks that they were stationed in. Uh, that's what it looks like from the side. They cut them out and they're, um, being used at a museum right now. Um, okay. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute. Uh, let's see stop share okay great um i'm gonna pause there that was a lot um that was very rapid fire um but uh are there any questions so far is there any like yeah any questions about my family or about that or in general and i can try to kind of connect it to what's happening today a little bit more too but um yeah we'll just take a break there yeah, definitely. Thank you for sharing that about your background. Because honestly, yeah, I have some family too who've been involved, like um, like great aunts who are also like Japanese and they talk about, yeah, the time that they've spent like in the internment camps. And I'm not even sure if people have received retribution from that or like an apology. Um, yeah, so kind of. Um, in the, so Fred Korematsu was a civil rights activist who uh, basically was the landmark case around the legality of uh, internment in the US. And he actually lost that case. The Supreme Court said that the Western or the, the war relocation authority was legally allowed to do what they did by forcibly incarcerating 120,000 citizens. And um, 
it's been viewed in the aftermath as one of like the two worst Supreme Court decisions. Um, and uh, in the 90s, under the Clinton administration, there was um, payments, uh, reparations payments made to Japanese American families that were interned. Um, I don't remember the amount. There's a letter that he wrote as an apology, basically. Um, and some families took it, some families didn't. Um, our family had at the time, you know, Ji Chan, my grandfather didn't want to take it. Ba Chan did. She was like, we have three kids in college. We're taking this money and we're going to use it. And she was always happy to talk about her experience and, and he never did. Um, it's definitely something that's not widely, I think, I think people are more aware of it now than they were when I was in grade school. But when I was in grade school, it was like a one paragraph blurb uh, on a side page in the history book. And I had to ask my parents what it was about. And then they got in touch with uh, Bachan and she came and showed me a shoebox shoe box full of photos. And we got to like have a conversation. And um, yeah, one of my biggest regrets was that I wasn't able to record those conversations because um, once our elders are gone, we got to do the best we can to to carry over those stories and those messages but it's um it's really valuable to have like their actual voices um that's the the qr code with the mural project is that's brilliant um more of that i think um and and along that vein like the work that that we do at kitchen table advisors is less prescriptive and more like uh, relationship driven. So, you know, we provide services to help with like record. We, we wanna help shore up, we trust farmers to be farmers and we wanna help them with the like, the business end of things, record keeping taxes, access to capital. And a lot of farmers either because they have um, you know, their immigration status is, is questionable or because um, of how they identify and the systemic barriers that have existed, are, it's hard for them to want to reach out to connect to some of these resources. And um, so at least in the work that I do business advising, it's a lot of like meeting people where they're at, asking them what help they need. And over a period of years, trying to develop that relationship and trust so that we can figure out what the best solutions are. Um, and help just like uplift and and tell those stories. I mean, we we live in a very caste kind of caste based world of of hierarchy and um, and it's all you know at the end of the day we're all the same species and we all need to navigate this planet. And um, I think I think um, yeah. So that's yeah. I'll just yeah. leave it there for thank now. Thank you. Yeah, thank All you right, for speaking okay. on your work <laughs> like, as well. No, no, that's okay. Time. Yeah, we, we love it. We love to hear it. Um, yeah, uh, I see Irene has, your, has her hand up. Go off. Yeah, I have a question for you, James. First of all, thank you for sharing about your family. It's so powerful. And, and yeah, I love how you connected it to the, the reproductive justice, right? Um, but I had a question actually about kitchen table advisors. What what region are you serving? Do you reach, like what, how far is the reach of Kitchen Table Advisors? So uh, we serve 16 counties in the Bay Area. We're distributed regionally. So there's kind of like uh, regional ecosystems that we kind of work out of. And there's uh, Yolo, Solano, Yolo Solano, Napa, Sonoma, East Bay, San Mateo Coast, which is where I work, uh, primarily up the coast side, like uh, Pescadero, Half Moon Bay, and then Salinas Gilroy. Um, and we actually, the majority of our, uh, of the, the farms that we support come from the Salinas uh, Gilroy region, which includes Santa Cruz and Watsonville. Um, we work a lot with the farmers coming out of Alba um, and, but, but also just, we, that's, we, so there's only one business advisor for the San Mateo coast and we have, we have four uh, or five down in um, Salinas Gilroy. Um, yeah. Cool. So I have an indigenous friend who's a farmer who just got access to land and wants to start a farm as a business. Could he connect with, with y'all and they'll do that? Like you'll sure. help him set something up? Well, so there, 
the one criteria that we kind of have when approaching farms to collaborate is that they've been established for a little while, just so that some of the farming production stuff is um, dialed. But that being said, like we want to help people and we want to help farmers. So, you know, capacity wise, I think it's, it's totally worth reaching out. Please have them get in touch with me or with anybody down in that region. It might, it might be better just have them reach out to me. Um, and, you know, long term, it would be really nice. One project I'm working on is putting together something for new farmers so that even though they might not be be able to be part of our like client program for three years that we can still um, provide some like resources. Um, I mean, I, I feel pretty strongly about helping people who want to grow food at a high quality for their communities. And so, you know, whatever we can help with, we will do. Yeah, wow, Sweet. that's incredible. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say too, cause I mean, I feel like uh, a lot of young folks, especially like maybe like people within the space would also resonate that like uh, people like wanna start growing their own food and have like their own plot of land. And you kind of touched on this like earlier about how like you see some parallels and like maybe if you could talk a little bit like what you see, like similar um, problems or like issues that arise or like parallels that have been arising with like the clients that you meet with. Um, but also, yeah, considering that they have like established land already, like these aren't like folks that are just getting started. I would say, generally speaking, challenges for most farms this year include navigating last year's craziness um, with the COVID and the fires. And then this year, there's also drought is a huge component. Um, there's a lot of pretty great funding available right now. Um, a lot of it is like either grant funding or fully forgivable loans and things like that, which uh, we've been trying to help connect people with. Um, more broadly speaking, I mean, it's it's all about like who holds the keys of power and what are these power dynamics about? And, and right now they're still very, um, those keys are being held by a few people and those people feel very, in, like they're very important. And so trying to, find find sources of capital for farmers that they can partner with that are that have equity built into the process and and don't just prescribe what's best for a community but actually bring in those community stakeholders to help determine the future and what it should look like and who should hold those keys is something that we try to do um, both through our research like how we how we collaborate with both funders and farmers and things like that. Um, but yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, it seems like you guys are like doing a lot of uh, like middle person work, like getting the communication and lingo like between like both parties and having like all pivotal people there. Most people who start a farm are very risk averse and they don't want to take on liability. They don't wanna owe anybody money. They don't want any debts. Um, and that makes sense. I don't think anybody wants that. But um, in order to be successful in the current society, capitalism, what have you that we live in, um, you know, being able to take on a little bit of liability, a little bit of risk to scale up your operation has shown to be pretty successful in terms of improving the 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 welfare of the people doing that work of the of those farm owners and then of the people that they hire to work with them as well um, yeah it just seems like a lot yeah a lot of people need to be involved like for yeah for a successful and effective um like production very much so and, yeah yeah and yeah before we open it up for like a uh, question and answers from the public i also wanted to ask you one last question uh yeah just like considering your background and like your historical background with your family with like farming and like those experiences, um, how would you like perceive like the next 20 years for like farmland within like California? You know, like, are there like major differences from like what you've seen as like when you were younger with them as compared to like what you see now and maybe like will vision like for the future and like farm workers within the future of California? Hmm. That's a great question. Yeah, I apologize. It's kind of a loaded question. I mean, the future looks kind of grim, but well, like in you reference know, to like climate change, yeah. 
I I had been extremely myopic the last four years, and I don't think I realized that until until after the change of the administration, and I was able to like kind of shake off my my <laughs> my sadness a little bit. But um, I think we're at this precipice for a really unique opportunity. People are realizing that community solutions really work, and that engaging in your local food shed and community system creates meaningful change for the people in that community. And um, I think there's an opportunity in California in particular, there is, we have this like super high tech, tech-based driven non, like what do they make? They It's code, it's, it's not tangible. And then we also grow, you know, 70% of the world's strawberries are grown in Salinas and Watsonville. And a majority of California's food is, you know, going out to, to the rest of the world. And I think between leveraging technological improvements that will help us deal with climate change, you know, issues around that, coupled with some very like, we need to rebuild a lot of systems from scratch. Um, and the way that the status quo had been doing things is no longer, not that it ever was great, but is extremely untenable today. And so um, hopefully by leveraging the kind of relationships that we're building on a smaller level, there's opportunities to leverage in like other, other institutions, other government entities to do the right thing. Um, what I would like to see in 20 years is people who want to be able to afford land to start a farm, you know, especially people who are indigenous and have lived here their entire lives and their people are from here and they want to grow food. They should not have to deal with the kind of barriers that they're dealing with now. And, um, and it shouldn't be, it should be not thought of as like this giving back thing, but as like that should be the new status quo. Um, I think, yeah. So, you know, it's challenging. And, and one thing I'll just say, I realize we only have three minutes left is that like, it's really encouraging that there's this level of engagement from, you know, like the food systems working group and, and just college students in general, because I think, um, you know, when, as I get older, I feel more responsible for the mistakes that the world is making um, as an adult. And, and when I'm older, I'm going to feel really sorry for all the things that I wasn't able to help prevent or to curb or to change. I'm sure I'll be happy that I've been able to make whatever little impact I've been able to make. But, um, you know, the youth energy is important and it's really powerful and it's galvanizing and, you um, you know, there's wisdom that comes from our elders, but there's also new fresh ideas that need to be, um, you know, incubated and fostered and supported. So um, I'm excited to see what the next kind of generation comes up with. Yeah, thank you. So eloquently put, honestly, yeah. I mean, I feel like it's the duality of things of just having a, a, a diverse group of people from like different age groups, you know, to provide like not only wisdom, but like, yeah, fresh ideas. And yeah, we can only be optimistic for the future and try our best because this this provides a fantastic opportunity, yeah, for rebuilding and doing things in a different way, in a more sustainable and effective way. But yeah, before we do end today, um, does anybody have any like questions before we hand it off? I'll pop my email into the chat. And uh, if anybody has any questions, wants to follow up, um or anything like that, just feel free to reach out. If you know folks that are farming that could use some support, have, you know, reach out to me. Um, yeah, we we have a pretty active social media where we try to keep things connected. So if you're on Instagram, I would follow Kitchen Table Advisors. Um, it's another great resource. So yeah, yeah and thank you very you much. Just, it's been an yeah. honor to present and um, yeah, I'm very grateful to, to be here and get to share some time with you all. Yeah, thank you so much for, for your experience sharing and for the work that you're doing. Also, like, yeah, very much looking forward to the possible uh, collaborations between you and Irene and your different projects happening. But yeah, if we want to show some love to both of our, our speakers today, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I know it's been a crazy, crazy week eight. And yeah, this court has been wild. But thank you for making time to be here and here.
what these fantastic beings have had to say. Alrighty, y'all. Well, thank you again for being here. But yeah, we'll definitely be in touch and we can send you guys these videos. Um, but I hope everyone has a lovely day. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye, Irene. It's good seeing you. Thanks, everyone. I'll be in touch. <laughs> okay, please do. Yeah.